All right. I think we're, yep, we're live. So, hello, everybody. Welcome to Write the Docs, episode number 32. Can't believe we've got 32 of these in the bag already. It's quite amazing. (laughs) I'd say that every episode, though. (laughs) Um, So, look, I just want to say, I hope you're all well, if you're listening from wherever you are in the world. And um, uh, I've certainly been an interesting year. I don't know if we're going to get another podcast recording in before the end of the year. Hopefully we will. But if we don't, um, I hope 2020 has been a good year for you, um, despite all the challenges. And um, uh, so, yeah, it's, it's been definitely interesting. But we're not here to talk about retrospectives. We're here to talk about something far more interesting. And that um, is going to be revealed very shortly. But first, I need to introduce our regular panel of guests. So could I please welcome to the show, Chris Ward. How are you going, Chris? Hey, I'm doing good. Um, Yeah, busy. Deadlines, things to release. Pretty good. All that sort of stuff. Yeah, right. Yeah. Now, uh, you're about to, unfortunately, go back down into lockdown um, over there, aren't you? Yeah, but um, I don't know. It wasn't so bad last time, apart from the lack of uh, sunlight. It'll be all right. (laughs) (laughs) certainly not something we have a problem with down here it's super hot and very Uh, rainy down here at the moment in brisbane so we're getting we're floating away down here (laughs) and our other panelists that we always love to hear from each month is tom johnson how are you tom i'm doing well how are you doing jared i'm i'm glad to uh have this podcast this is kind of a highlight i love uh joining in okay well thanks for that tom now we're going to jump into the topic of the day, and that topic is actually writing books in ASCII doc. So, as many documentarians will know, um, ASCII doc is one of the better ways of creating documentation for end users. It's got a really diverse and uh, well supported um, set of markup patterns that you can use to, to write really quite complex technical documentation. Uh, it gives you tight control. Um, over um, how you present that documentation to users. But what you might be surprised about is you can actually use ASCII doc to write fiction and nonfiction books and publish those books. So with that in mind, I'd actually like to introduce um, our guest today, which is Mehmed Pasic. Now, Mehmed, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. It's so great to have you on today. I think this is going to be a really interesting topic because I think a lot of folks probably associate ASCII doc with technical documentation, but I think there's, there's quite a lot of um, people out there who are using ASCII doc for different things. And just, this is just one example of that. But um, before we launch in, I want to get a bit of an idea of um, um, what you're about and and where you're from. So how about you um, give us a bit of uh, info about where you're from? Uh, I'm coming from Sarajevo, Bosnia, Herzegovina and I work for many, many publications. That is a publishing company from New York. And uh, that company is basically publishing technical books, mostly technical books. And level of complexity of those books is very familiar to you. And we are dealing with all challenges regarding that. <laughs> So Manning does a lot of technical publications, but I've also learned that they, they also work with students as well and do a lot of student publishing. Is that right? Yes. But uh, yes, we are, our marketing is working with a bunch of conferences and we are related to teaching. We are related to students who are learning from our books because, for example, probably their professors are those authors who, who are writing the books. Right, okay. Well, that's a very diverse range of, I guess, subject matter and topics. So I think we should probably get into a little bit more information. But I think probably what we should start with is, um, I guess, with the, the whole idea of a book publisher, for people who may not be super aware of, they probably think, you know, there's a publishing house they get the books on the shelves, but there must be more to it than that. So maybe, maybe you could tell us a little bit of the basic sort of 
stuff that publishers help authors with to try and get their books out into the marketplace? Maybe give us a rundown on what that looks like. Uh, we are one of the companies that, that included the early access program. So basically, author is coming to our house and starting to write a book in a raw state, and then we are publishing chapter by chapter, chapter after chapter, and a lot of people who are interested in that subject are included actually in writing those books. So basically, we are supporting whole writing process uh, and publishing all of that at the same time. So we are included very early and we are technically uh, very connected to them uh, in terms of uh, creating the product in the fastest possible way uh, and expecting and allowing ourselves to make mistakes and which, which will be presented and accept those mistakes as a inclusion in corrections and and hopefully at the end, the good content. So it sounds like you take a really iterative approach with, with authors that come to you and help them build up what they want to write based on, yes. based on the whole process of sort of extracting the information out and then helping them produce it in a way that actually makes sense. Yes. So it sounds like a lot of, a lot of um, I guess, mentoring happens as part of, yes. as part of the uh, mean, early access. I mean, usually uh, development editors are included from the start and we are also included to, to make uh, the raw state of the book in something that, it, that can be seen, that can be presented to readers. So. Right, right. so that's why the whole team is included and I think that's the good way to create good content. Hey, uh, Mehmed, question. You, you said that... Um you will often accept mistakes and kind of correct them and iterate on the books. Can you talk more about that? You know, traditionally, once a book is published, another version is kind of a major release, but it sounds like you do more continual uh, updates and publishing. I'm still talking about early access program. Oh, okay. So early access program is something that is not finished. And ah. that's the idea behind it. This okay. is not finished. And if you can say, if you can comment it, and say something useful, you're becoming a part of that book, and that book is passing a lot of a lot of corrections on the way. I'd be interested to hear more about how you collaborate with authors. I mean, uh, in the documentation world, getting people to add comments on documentation and, and responding to them is a huge challenge. Does Manning have special tools, or do you use standard tools? And how does ASCII Doc play into that? Uh, when you talk about our list of books, we, uh, I can start, uh, our list include usually material written in uh, Microsoft Word or OpenOffice or any part, of, or, or for example Google Docs as similar tools. And on the second one is Askidov. It became popular since, I don't know, since that happy marriage with GitLab and Ruby. And later on, we have, it's even more often that we use ASCII doc manuscripts uh, in relation to, in comparison to InDesign, Markdown, Google Docs, FrameMaker, etc. So we are accepting a lot of uh, different tools. We are accepting a lot of different sources of manuscripts and we're dealing with them as we, as we learn. So ASCII doc is very, it's coming are, I think ter almost 30% of the books is written in ASCII doc. And we use ASCII doc heavily on our website too. So this is very good. We, we have very good relation with them. And ASCII doc is written in, do you wanna, do you want me to, do you wanna hear something about tools? We yeah, use? We, we could probably go into the tools discussion now, probably don't you think Chris and Tom? Do you think it flows yeah, in? It, it yeah. would also possibly be a good idea for those of who are not familiar to understand um, the the subtle differences between ASCII doc and other equivalents as well. 
Um, maybe we should even do that first. <laughs> That's actually a good idea, Chris. Let's, let's do that. Let's explore the differences that, I guess, from a, I guess, you know, the, the markdowns are uh, certainly markdown. The second one. Well, different. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But so what do you think, um, you know, if you could summarize the differences yourself between something like markdown and something like ASCII doc, my med, what do you think the main differences are to you? For me, I can't find differences if I look at the screen and see the document. I can't see too many differences. I mean, logic is the same. They use a similar, similar way to present uh, each part of the structure. They use similar ways to, uh, similar tools to convert those. But I believe ASCII doctor is someone who speed fast in uh, development and I believe they are, they have a huge advantage because of that. Do you find support that support and development support and development? Right. Do you find that, um, you know, you were talking before about all the different formats that you accept the, the scripts in from uh, authors. Do you find that, um, when you're trying to assemble a book um, for okay. publishing, do you find you hit certain limitations with some of the formats that you receive um, from authors, or do you take it in your stride and just roll with it and and get the end product out? How does that sort of work? Um, that always depends on complexity of the particular book, because if you're talking about functional programming, if you're talking about mathematics that's very difficult to present because from the start I have to mention that we are creating uh, PDFs that's one type and the other one is EPUB which is basically HTML incorporated in one zip folder yeah and so HTML and PDFs are very different because PDF is printed on your screen printed you can see it on the screen and it's document is done and when we transfer that to HTML, we can find difficulties on how to present something that is not common. And that you can read on your offline, when you offline on your phone. So we're talking about tasks. So you, you can always find limitation with anything complex enough. So, but we try to simplify things, especially during our early access program, when we try to simplify things to be, to be done and corrected later. Hmm. Okay. And maybe here's a good time to talk about the difference between ASCII doc and ASCII doctor, which you mentioned, okay. and it's, it's often a point of confusion. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so what, what are the two? ASCII is the yeah. place where we learn something about ASCII doc. <laughs> <laughs> I believe, and we use most of the tools like using Ruby, we collect all the gems that, that are out there and where they resource levels of difficulties. So I believe ASCII Doctor has a huge potential to develop us to the level that nothing, nothing is a problem. So. I think the way I sort I of sum it up is, I'm oh, sorry. You use it as well, don't you, Jared? I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, we yeah. use ASCII doc and, and Tora where I work at Swiss oh, okay. to, to, produce yeah. our, um, to our, produce our website um, using the Antora site builder. I, I guess the way I look at ASCII doc and ASCII doctor is that ASCII doc is the language, but ASCII doctor mm. is the processor that allows yes. you to transfer, transform the language yes. into pages. Like you say, it could be HTML. Mm. Could even be PDF or EPUB. They all have transformation. XML as well. XML. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. It's pretty much a Swiss knife of, of structured mm -hmm. authoring. And I think that the whole idea behind ASCII doc was when Dan Allen, the, the person who sort of used to work at Red Hat, when he set it up, he wanted to make the contributions easier and he wanted to make yes. the ability to, you know, take the content that you've written and turn it into different formats. It was a real challenge at Red Hat at the time because we were all using XML at Red Hat and yes. that wasn't really great for contribution. It was very specialized. So something like ASCII doc really appealed to him and he could see 
the value in it. So he left Red Hat to pursue it. And here we are today with, I think, ASCII-Doc 2.0.x is nearly about to be released. So it's, yeah. it's certainly come a long way in about, I think it's around 10 years now, like ASCII Doctor has. Or maybe less. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think. Yeah, that brings up uh, an interesting question. You, you talk about how ASCII Doc has made it easier to publish into different formats, right? To PDF, to EPUB, hmm. HTML. How does that um, pose challenges to book publishers? I mean, if, if a layperson can just generate all these formats, uh, what value does the publisher add um, you know, to, to this endeavor? Sometimes we sell content early, an early stage. So, but we are talking about, I mean, a level of security or in, must be on the highest level, but uh, we offer content early and people are buying books before they written. And sometimes that's the value in that. And people like to learn that way. Sometimes you need, you learn the subject during the year, during that need process, during the whole mm -hmm. year. So basically that book is already finished before it's published for some, some of the readers. I think personally as well, I, I did a book with one publisher and I actually worked on um, a, um, it was in our notes and now it's the, the live, live video you have as live well? Live video, yeah. For Manning. Um, and actually for me personally, working with two editors, a technical editor and a language editor, I suppose, was... Developmental, yeah. Yeah, it was extremely beneficial. Um, I think as, as people who write documentation, you, we kind of have review processes, but I'm always wondering how, how uh, in-depth those re review processes go. But book publishers, the editors, do tend to go a lot deeper uh, and make you think a lot more about structure as well because documentation people don't really read in any sort of order. They just jump around, whereas a book yeah. people do tend to read from start to finish. And having to think about the structure uh, and the implications of that structure was quite an interesting exercise. It's, it's quite a challenging one, actually. <laughs> well, speaking of, of, it is. Speaking of jumping around, uh, sorry, go ahead, my man. You, no, you know, no, it's all right. Uh, well, speaking of jumping around, Chris, like I feel as if there is also a trend even in book publishing um, markets to, to sell access to a whole library of books. For example, O'Reilly books or Safari books, whatever it's called, right? If you want to learn PHP or something, um, would you rather just kind of search for it within their library and jump from book to book and maybe you land on one that you think is perfect and you only want a certain chapter or would you rather like uh, guess which book would be the most appropriate, buy it, and then feel committed to read it from beginning to end, even if it's like not mm. the best choice? It's an interesting question. There's, there's, something, there's still something to be said about the journey of going through a book and feeling like you're accomplishing something as opposed to just jumping around random tutorials and piecing it all together. Um, of course, the problem with books, and I'm sure MedMed can talk to this, <laughs> is that sometimes the length of time it takes you to get through it, it's out of date already. Um, I think I've been working through a Unity book from Manning for about two years, and I'm pretty sure most of the content is not much use to me anymore, but I'm still working my way through it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so it, yeah, it's especially, interesting. Especially with technical books, I find that it's very difficult to figure out uh, what's the right level. If, if I mm. want to go learn Android, for example, right? It's like you can choose between the head first dummies type books, right? Which are like, here's how you install it versus Android for pro developers. And it's like oh, way over my head. So, I mean, for me, it's really, it's hard to gauge like what's the right level. And I'm sure it's the same with a lot of technical books. Um, trying to figure out. Anyway, uh, I, I know Manning has specific commissioning uh, editors for that. I don't know if MedMed, do you have particular much uh, involvement in that, but uh, they often go looking for subjects and writers. Yes, I mean, we are aware of the subject that are mainstream, for example. So 
So our position is, acquisition team is going around uh, so searching for conferences on a particular subject and look for talent. I mean, that's how they do it. And it's somehow easier because you probably all know when you touch one subject that only five names will come up. <laughs> and those five names are usually some professors, some prestigious faculties. Are. I've heard that, that with traditional books, like romance books or something, 90% uh, of the revenue at book publishers are based on very few authors. I'm just kind of curious. Can you speak candidly? How much uh, does a typical book bring with revenue? And do you, does like technical book publishing follow the same revenue paradigm as, as like the romance where you've got, you know, most of your revenue from a small selection? It, yeah, it's usually, I, I can talk about that. I can't tell you about revenue, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't have any number in front of me, but um, yeah, I can speak. I mean, we can say that uh, one subject can be mainstream for two years and those authors from that subject, for example, can, can be the highest earners, for example, and they earn from the, I mean, and they involved in promotion as well because everybody is willing to promote their own book and and when they promote it, we reward them in that way too. So we find a way that uh, act like a team, I believe. So it all sounds like there's a bit of uh, ownership on both parties to actually promote and, and yes. educate people that's available. It's not just the sure. publisher's job to do that. No, everybody's interesting to to promote their own material. I mean, we all know how social media is working right now. It's really a huge part of the promotions. Yeah, that's an interesting point because I, I guess my my perception of it was that if you essentially sign up to a a publisher, then they almost take over some of the promotion for you as part of your book. But it's interesting to hear that. Um, it's certainly in the case of, of Manning, uh, that's a different model altogether. And it's actually, yeah. ev everyone is in, in there. Everyone's got skin in the game, I guess, and they all sure. need to publish it out. Uh, we are in times where if you promote me, I will promote you and we will both be happy. So <laughs> everybody <laughs> wins, right? That yeah. <laughs> that's cha changed. I mean, if you compare everything from here to 30 years ago, you'll mm. find huge differences in that's actually That's actually a really good segue because we had a question uh, relating to that. I'm sure that over the years you would have seen quite a shift in in how publishing has evolved and changed with the times. And you, you touched on like in the last 30 years it's changed. But what do you mm. think are some of the biggest shifts in publishing? Paper. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some of the youngest one will don't understand what I'm saying. <laughs> I think the only paper technical books I have are caught the, the free copies of the first book I wrote from the publisher. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like it's, everything's going to ebook and online. And Definitely. no one really wants I to mean, do trees anymore. That's it. Who will what, find the time to go to the bookstore? I don't know. Tell me yeah, what, what are, yeah. what are And the now you got your formats? material on your phone in, in 12 seconds after they start a promotion. So mm, that's true. What uh, we can there... say about that? I mean, we are all leaning to e publications and the, those are here to stay. <laughs> what are the most popular digital formats? I mean, you've got the the EPUB, EPUB you mentioned, EPUB. right? PDF. Yeah. You've also got like a live HTML kind of format, right? Like just a live book. Uh, it's called live book, but that's basically EPUB. So and, EPUB okay. is that so, format we use for our online version of the book. And you said EPUB is the most popular? Yeah, definitely. Well, why why is that far. more popular than like um, Moby for Moby. Kindle or something? 
I don't know. I prefer the rendering. I try everything, and I prefer mm. rendering of the EPUB mm. most. And I'm, and number of you can find number of decent uh, apps for EPUB, but you can't find too many for Mobi. Yeah, or AZ it's, or it's it's kind of the main problem in that Mobi is largely a Kindle format. It's yes. not exclusively, but it largely is. So you're kind of restricted to that ecosystem, whereas EPUB is more open. So you have access to a lot more options. <laughs> <laughs> and it's open. It's a zipped folder, so you can really yeah. open that. Um, <laughs> Literally and in Literally open. Yeah. 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 Do do people read? technical books on um ink readers what do you call the, the not a kindle but anything that's digital reader or do they mostly read them on their on their like <laughs> like an oh, ipad tablet okay <laughs> yeah like what what, do, what devices do people mostly use to read books especially technical ones with code samples uh, uh codes are really related to computer species most often but people prefer to read uh, read on on the tablet and they prefer to work with it on on their computer oh, so, right so yeah. it sounds so like they, they some get stuff to it. and some subject you can learn actually we, we got uh, books in in months of lunches for example mm. where we mm. choose subjects that, that can be read on your lunch break and you usually use your tablet or, or small laptop or something. Do you find the way, that's a really interesting point, like slicing content up in a way that you can do it in your lunch break or do it on a commute into work. Have you found that the way that you structure um, EPUB and that sort of format has changed as well? Like, do you find that you don't have longer chapters and sort of have smaller bite-sized bits when you design a, a book structure? I mean, when we're talking about books, they almost have a similar content. So maybe you can have six chapters of some highest level of or deep level of uh, one subject and you, you can have light version in, in 30 or so page or 30 or so chapters. That depends. And we can go back to Tom's question because Tom asked earlier how to find what level of the book I'm looking for. Mm. And that's why we create certain editions where uh, in a month of large breaks you can, you, you can finish some one low level of subject. Um, if you need to go deeper, you need to find books with six chapters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Let's maybe uh, flip back to the ASCII.doc perspective. I was firstly interested because you did mention other formats. Mm. Um, and it's funny, like even personally, I still, when I'm writing long form books, which is mostly actually fiction, I'm not really writing um, non-fiction in, in this, uh, I will tend to turn to a tool like Scrivener, for example, which very much shows that I'm a, a Mac and iOS user because it is on <laughs> Windows, but it's, it's sort of not great on Windows. It's all right on Windows, <laughs> but um, it's, not, it's not optimal on Windows. Um, is, and a lot of people still come from a, a kind of a Word background, for example. Is there a is there a, do, do some people find a bit of a learning curve? I know when I first started using markup languages, I found it quite weird to begin with, and then I really got used to it. But, or is a lot of the writers coming from a technical background, they're usually okay with it? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's difficult to find the logic in that because you can write a book without doing anything, without mm. formatting anything, and you can go back true. and and you can finish that book in a couple of days. Finish formatting yeah. of the book. That's yeah. the advantage of us. I mean, you That's have true. your content and you don't deal with, and you don't deal with previews or anything. You just deal with the content, with the sentence, and uh, that's the one challenge of the author. Mm. 
And the other one is um, when they start learning and, and they start and they become inspired to do something special, that's the other advantage of that because they're looking for, for some feature that they know they exist in other, on other mm. medias and they, they try to do that and that's the, the other challenge. So we have to deal with those. But at, at the end of the day, it's quite easy to learn. So to mm. me, that's not a challenge. That's not a huge challenge. I mean, everybody can learn that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not just technical people, everybody can learn that. So I'm interested to sort of know, so as a preference, it sounds like um, Manning prefer to go with ASCII doc as the way to publish so they they take anything in from people but they use ascii doc to to actually produce the the final product and then publish it out to the different formats can you walk us through how you sort of go from receiving the text to then publishing it out sort of like a a, a light introduction to the workflow. You don't feel like you need to go into super detail, but like sort of go over. The yeah, I can mention a couple of pads because we don't use the, the single one. Hmm. That'd be great. Uh, we choose to pro, uh, to create products directly from Askedoc, yeah. but that's not usually the final product. That's usually something for the view, something simple, something not not that important. And when we choose to go with a, something presentable, like me, pub date or final books, go to different routes. Uh, first route is to go, we use XML heavy still, because we use XML books. As, we, we have authors with XML books as well, so that's the simplification of the process. We are ending in the, in the other one. So that's how we choose to print and present and control our starter sheet via XML. Uh, when we print, we can print via XML. We, we can print via directly from ASCII. And sometimes we can use tools like Atom as a good preview and use their, their output version for something, for article or chapter or depending on complexity and then we go to challenges of mathematics and functional programming and how and how to present that we pick and choose we pick and choose what is easier easiest way to do it so hmm. i'd imagine with with mathem mathematics heavy content you're having to deal with things like latex and stuff like that when you're yes. latex jared latex latex <laughs> you know i've heard some people say latex which is even worse <laughs> so yeah. latex so LaTeX. yeah when you when you're dealing with with things like latex um i'd imagine that starts to refine down the choices of tools and output formats that you're actually going to because yeah, we need to include LaTeX, but LaTeX is only for PDF. Ah, oh, right, okay. We all know. So when we start going to offline device in your hand, we need to present that in, in other ways. So we try to avoid LaTeX as much as we can. Mm, okay. <laughs> I think a lot I of people kind of, the same way. <laughs> I, I bizarrely, I bizarrely quite like the uh, the uh, I quite like Galatech, but it is very, very esoteric. <laughs> yeah, I don't like it, but I have to use it sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And do you do you ever do you ever bring in my favorite tool in the world into the process, Pandoc? <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> we can discuss about it later. Yeah, I love like Pandoc. <laughs> Pandoc is the answer to about 80% of questions on the Write the Doc Slack, as far as I can, okay. as far as I can tell. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it really is. It is the Swiss army knife of converters. It'll take anything and change it into anything. It really does. Really? I need to try that. Yeah. It's, it's a little, it's a little, um, 
it's, it's, I don't mean it's old in terms of it doesn't work, but it's been around for a while. And as far as I know, ASCII mm. Doctor replicates a lot of that functionality, or is that true? When you say replicate, ASCII Doctor. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's got an output format to ASCII Doc, but I believe it's the Python version, not the, um, not, not the new version, which is subtly different. This is why ASCII Doc at the moment is going through a, a specification development phase. Oh, um, it's, so, it's, it's becoming markdown, is it? No, no it's actually, well, oh, no. You want to start comparing markdown to ASCII Doc, maybe? First, you have to look up the flavor sheet. I think it's up to about 35 different flavors of Markdown now. But, so. but hang on, you just, you just described a flavor there. So it's getting there. It's getting there. <laughs> well, that's what they're trying to do. At the moment, there's two, right? So there's, there's Python, ah, okay. ASCII doc, and then there's ASCII doctor. Pro, there's yeah. ASCII doc process with ah, ASCII doc, which adds really. stuff. And this is a problem. You, you, you're right, though, Chris. Like, it's, it is a flavor. So, my, I mean, my, my main issue has always been, and I've brought this up a few times, has not been the, the format itself, is that there is very little tooling around it for, for plugins, for text editors and things. There isn't much. Um, for ASCII doc. And that's, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a fair few now. Like, I, I haven't found okay. a tool that doesn't have support. Uh, you know, v no, no, not support, not support, but the, the other options. Um, for example, I can find five plugins for VS Code that lets me do um, keyboard shortcuts for formats or buttons in the toolbar and shortcuts for this and shortcuts for that. Like you have a plethora of options. All right. Uh, some, are, some are not great and some are great. And, you know, <laughs> but with ASCII doc, I've usually found there's a lot. It's the, same, it's the same with restructured text as well, to be fair. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Unique to, yeah. I think you tend to find um, with, with the ASCII Doctor yeah. uh, ecosystem, there's yeah. one person yeah. sort of does one, um, looks after one plugin for one editor type. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, normally it's pretty well featured, um, but you're right. There is, I guess, less, less varieties out there or less different ways of thinking mm. about how you, you do it. Which is, of course, the positives and negatives of yeah. those options. <laughs> Not much choice is a positive and a negative in both cases. <laughs> That's right. It's very much the Costco model, isn't it? You go to Costco, they have two things. You might have two different types of uh, almonds that you can get, but that's it. No, not 20. But it's easy to choose. Uh, yeah. Well, look, getting back to the... Um, is difficult to choose from the two. But <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, I got a question um, for, for Mehmet. I'm just looking at manning.com and I see that you've got both video and books. We've been talking almost exclusively about books in part because of the ASCII doc element. I'm just wondering which sells better videos or books? Are there different audiences that prefer different formats? I believe that books are still writing content is still something you're looking for when you in terms of technical books in terms of technical subject we got authors who does both but main content is usually in, in book form and is that because uh technical like deep technical topics don't lend themselves well to video it's like too complicated to just explain in a video yes i believe you, when you need the code when you read, for example, you can switch to, for example, um, a live book page of, of any book and see that you can make copy of the code and implement it in your mm. in your environment. So yeah, and test it. So that kind of stuff. Mm. What is live project? I see that as an option next to live book, live video, live project. But a live project is related to a combination. I mean, when, when you when you need to do something multimedia. That's okay. not a term I've heard for a while. <laughs> oh yeah, it's nice. nice. <laughs> do you find, Mamed? Do you find that when people have produced a book, do you find that the videos flow on? from the feedback they receive about the book? Has there ever been like a point where hmm. videos are informed from the book itself and what people are really looking for more information on? 
Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, I'll rephrase that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm curious, is after an author has published a book, do you find okay, that... Okay, after. Yeah, after or like during the early access phase where they're receiving feedback from the people Yeah, yeah, joined, when they evolve already, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, like during that process, do you find that um, that's when they work out if they need to create video content or is it sort of, does it happen at different points or does it not even inform the, the conversation at all? Good. I mean, every author is involved in writing articles as well, writing, presenting videos if they have, uh, they're involved in conferences where, where we are tied to. And they are ready to do everything that is appropriate for, I believe, presentation of the book. But we always talking about the book as a final product. Everything else may come as a promotion of that or promotion of the brand, personal brand, of author's personal brand, brand. So they're choosing to do videos as well. They're choosing to do variety of the things, guests, interviews, podcasts. So it's really a complimentary format. That, yes. But the book yeah. is always king. Yeah, the book is always. Hmm. That's really interesting. From our perspective, but we are publishers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will also say, like having made uh, video courses and books, the the thing with video is it takes a lot more time, and also editing is there's a, there's a couple of platforms emerging now. They're mostly in the audio space, but they are starting to test video as well. They let you edit audio and video like text, like, quote unquote in big quotes because they're still very early days. But if someone says move a chapter around or change this terminology in a book in text, it's quote unquote, again, relatively easy. Doing that in a video is a lot more work. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I personally enjoy the work, but it's very time consuming. Mm. Uh, and you often so what do you try prefer? To find... well, it... How so do I... you prefer your content to be presented? At the moment, I'm really enjoying live streaming because it's just done. Yeah. <laughs> it's video it's Ooh. direct but there's no going back it's done if i make a mistake you just keep going and it's done um, but do you find yourself that you can do everything with, with the stream no of course not um because i mean what is it, what is missing from that it's i think for me it's the um it's the the just the going for it and people seeing you making mistakes as well a book and a video course are always the finished product Whereas streaming is, you see people making mistakes along the way. And mm. I think that's actually where people learn from as well. Um, which is getting a little off topic. That's possibly another good potential topic for the future. But it's, um, it's, I mean, yeah, video, video, is, video is more popular at the moment. Yeah. But it's still, I mean, from our perspective, it's still not, it still has some time to do. I think I, I wonder if I wonder if you have much uh, metrics to support this, but you know, video courses as a popular consumable media yes. have emerged quite recently in a time when people are not used to paying for things, mm. whereas books have existed for a long time in a format where people were used to paying for it, and I think people still reduced the value of video, even though it's it's even if you can find real junk, yeah. Yeah, you know, people are used to not paying for it. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but when you do videos, do you find reason to be involved in some kind of greater community where subject is matter? It depends. It's more subject for me um, than anything else, to be honest with you. Depends on the subject. Sometimes I've done video courses because someone asked me to, and sometimes I've done it because I wanted to. So, <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have a question, um, Mehmed. I'm just kind of glancing through a sample book on Manning. And um, I imagine as a publisher, you have to make a, a judgment call about how to chunk up chapters. Um, hmm. Like the sample book I'm looking at, like it shows the whole chapter. If I printed it out, it'd probably be 30 pages. Uh, is there any logic you use to determine whether to make the page really long or to make it short? Um, 
that's the role of the developmental editors, and they usually know how many chapters you need for and how they long. I mean, they all start writing contrast with the for the book and mentioning number of pages of the book. So they start from there and they reduce in those pages or increasing depends on mm. what happened along the way. Okay. So book is like yeah, thirty pages is very often. Mm. Okay. I think I'm running out of questions. I don't know if Chris, Tom, if you've got any more questions uh, to, to add. I have a couple more. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I can just ask them. Just a, a few a few ideas of, I don't know, come to my mind as I'm looking through this. You're about to when pitch you, some books, Tom? Uh, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> um, so this, this sample book I'm looking at now has, has a, uh, some code samples. And yes. the technique they're, they've used is to do screenshots of the code samples with some overlays uh, that have like annotations. Just kind of curious, what's your take on the best way to present code samples uh, online? Do you have um, like our images better because you can annotate them or do you prefer to have the raw code that can be easily copied uh, and pasted? You probably find some of the older books because we use code and you have bottom below the copy the raw format without annotations mm. yeah okay so that's the option so that's the good way to test your you can read your book and choose, pick and choose your copies copies of the code and implement it in the raw state without annotation so that's the way that's what we're doing now so maybe if you find neat version of it, some of the neeps you'll find the example of how to, to copy code and use it for your purpose yeah okay yeah that makes sense i mean i definitely know that people like to to copy code but i also realize it's hard to annotate um when it's in code form it's hard to call out different parts of it you know like especially a long we're excluding sample. those so that's the greatest advantage of library library because you can't do it on video epub or pdf as well hmm. That's the huge advantage of life, mm. and mm. one of the very important features is just that to make clean code. To make clean code. Mm. I also notice this is just kind of a small curiosity um, for the live book. As I'm scrolling down, it like starts out in a um, Greek format, whatever, and then as you scroll, it like undeciphers it. Is that just to protect the digital rights of the book? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> no, <laughs> but I'm not um, involved in that. So, okay, so I'm not sure on that. I'm yeah, not sure. That's I, right. That never happened to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, it's, all right. That's fine. Tom, Tom's just yeah, up. but I can read everything from the menu system. So yeah. yeah. We can discuss this later. <laughs> Maybe we get back. Yeah. Could, yeah. could I just ask one other question about the, the format, um, Moby and EPUB? I mean, PDF is a whole other kind yes. of world in its sort yeah. of strange proprietary open bucket. Um, but Moby and EPUB, are they formats that change very much or has it basically been the same standard for a long time? It, I mean, they evolve. They have version trees, the current one. Mm. So they change it. EPUB, for example, EPUB 3, that's the... Okay. But they don't change too much. <laughs> I mean, that's basically a small, small website, small website with a style sheet and where you can read something and hopefully in the way mm. publisher presented it. So mm -hmm. that's, mm. but changes are minor in my, from my experience. So EPUB would probably never support that kind of thing, like the option to toggle code and things like that. I'm not sure how to do that. I mean, yeah. it must be yeah. possible. But that, those <laughs> plugins, when they, or scripts, when they work, yeah. I'm not sure that will work on every device. No, exactly. I mean, yeah. we are getting there. I mean, in five years, everything is possible. Yeah. yeah. 
Like maybe we will launch big. our own. Maybe every publisher will launch their own. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> have to read their books probably would be the best option. Yeah, I mean, this, this happens with um, some. I have a subscription to a service called Scribed. They use their own format in their apps, and it's, it's fine, but there's no... There's no interoperability will, anywhere. Will, so, yeah. <laughs> so, it won't be yeah. that popular. <laughs> yeah. No, no. <laughs> yeah, but I believe IPA will evolve that where you can yeah. use think even, every kind of media. You, 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 yeah. Yeah, video, videos, code. Even Apple, Apple tried the whole iBook thing and that was a bit of a disaster as well. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But I like the look of the iBook. Yeah, it, it looked amazing. Just no one bought them. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, well, they can't be successful in their <laughs> <laughs> This is true. They can't be perfect. They're pretty good. Yeah. They can't be perfect. <laughs> They're pretty good. I believe. Now, before there you are still people involved, I believe. Yeah, there are still yeah. people involved. Well, it's time for us to actually. Um, wrap up the show i can't believe this hour has gone as quickly as it has but bef before it's a bit we go harder because of the day of the day yeah <laughs> because of the... <laughs> i so, had a long day sorry <laughs> no no oh, that's all right no it's been really interesting to get a bit of uh the the whole inside um knowledge about how publishing works and how as as you know a writer you can actually get involved and and get your your ideas published fast through early access programs and yes. and iterate rapidly on it and get feedback and actually make a really good quality end product and you yeah. don't you don't need to feel Contribute overwhelmed. Contribute quality, yeah, that's yeah. a great contribution to quality. Definitely. It might actually it might actually help folks sort of take that leap into publishing because they know that if they they don't have to have something perfect, they just need to have a good idea that they can build yeah. upon as they develop. So that's been really really mm -hmm. interesting. I just want to thank I you mean, so much. That could work in technical books. I'm not sure. If you can find any other area where people will be interested in that, mm, you're probably right. But this is very different community, I mean, mm. people. No, absolutely. So that that's the reason why, and everybody is willing to contribute. That's the other case. That's right. Well, look, before mm. we go, I just wanted to uh, let folks know um, about a discount that's available to them um for uh through manning publications and thank you very much for for giving this discount to us um Ahmed and, and manning um if you'd like to receive a 35 percent um discount on any products in any format from manning publications you can do so by using the special write the docs code which is pod write doc 20 that's p-o-d-w-r-i-t-e-d-o-c-2-0 and that will give you 35% off any, um, any format and uh, any book on the Manning site, which is pretty awesome. Thank you very much for that. Um, and also, not only that, but if you've been listening to the show today, you can also um, get a uh, completely free book code from us if you answer a question for us on the podcast channel. So what we'd like to know um, is... How do you like to listen to the show? Do you like to listen to it on, um, on YouTube? Do you like to watch us talk or do you like to listen to us talk? So if you want to uh, give us your answers, you can do that um, on the podcast channel in writethedocs.org Slack. And the first five people will snag a free book code. Uh, so uh, that's pretty cool as well. It's the first time we've done a giveaway on the show, which is pretty exciting. <laughs> so, yeah, that's really awesome. So that does lead us to the end of the show. Thank you very much for joining us, Mehmed, today. Um, it's been great talking with you. Thanks also, Chris and, and Tom, for joining us as well. And um, uh, as we always do at the end of the show, we always end with this, docs or it didn't happen. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a great uh, time until we meet you again. <laughs>